What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Got something here, it's a wee bit heavy. Thought maybe you might shed some light on what that is right there. It's been to museums, it's been to paleontologists. No one seems to know what it is. Some are even saying something ET. So who knows, it's a mystery. You know, it could be a petrified spaceship. <laughs> It weighs about 40 pounds. I don't know what it is. I take my trade very seriously. So it's pretty rare when an item comes into my shop and I don't have some idea what it is. I've had it x-rayed. It's not magnetic. It's not radioactive or anything. I don't know. I mean, it, it could be something petrified. It's not dinosaur dung. OK, so you had that checked out. Mm -hmm. Because it does look like that perfect piece of poo. <laughs> actually took a little piece off right here and sent it to a meteorite man and meteorite man yes and what did he say it was he said i have no idea what you have there meteorites sell at auction anywhere from 25 cents to 25 dollars a gram this thing is over 40 pounds i mean you do the math if this thing is from space we could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars Today, we'll show you the best of moments when time travel artifacts were bought on Pawn Stars. Bringing in my armillary sphere. Armillary spear? Yes, sir. In the back of my brain, I have heard the term, but I've completely forgot what that means, so. <laughs> it, it's definitely interesting. Do you know anything about this? I've had a little research done on it. I've heard names of it um, as a astrological globe. I've been told it was made in the late 17, early 1800s. From what I can understand, half of it is Islamic and half Arabic, I think. And the ring, whatever this is, is Greek. That's a Persian armillary sphere. This okay. is really cool stuff. This would be used by a Zoroastrian priest. The Zoroastrian religion was the original religion of Persia. And these priests were very highly involved with star systems. You know, 2,000 years ago, they were mapping the stars. Okay, so how uh, old? What gives it away to me is this old Persian writing. You can just see how primitive it is on there. That has a tendency to me to say, uh, maybe 1780 to like 1820. Back to the Future Replica DeLorean. Bob showcased a painstakingly crafted DeLorean time machine replica from Back to the Future. Oh. The DeLorean time machine from Back to the Future. You gotta see this thing in the dark. Awesome. Is this the actual one from the movie? No, this is a replica that I built. What possessed you to build this? When I was a kid, I saw that car fly away at the end of the movie, and I've been in love with it ever since. And when I was old enough, I bought a DeLorean and just started tinkering with it. And after about 10 years, you end up with this. Inside the car, you have everything just like it was in the film. The time drive switch, of course, the flux capacitor, which makes time travel possible. You have the time circuits. You can punch in any date. Let's go back to the day Rick was conceived and stop it from happening. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these parts are military aircraft parts, custom-made aluminum. This, of course, is the famous Mr. Fusion, which is made out of a coffee grinder. So it's got the original motor? Unfortunately, yes. It has the original DeLorean engine. Okay, um, just about every car in the world on a vintage car, you want the original motor, except this was just such a bad motor. Ooh. It wasn't really known for its reliability. Rick acknowledged the visual allure, but highlighted mechanical challenges during a nostalgic test drive. Can we take it for a spin? Sure. Chum, open up the garage. Let's take this thing for a spin. October 26, 1985. Let's go. This is cooler than the Batmobile, Rick. Why are we driving this? All the buttons work. Listen to this thing. This thing looks pretty futuristic, but underneath, this is some ancient technology. Yeah, this thing lost its appeal, right? <laughs> it's hot, slow, and it smells like gas. <laughs> yeah. The negotiation between Rick and Bob hit a roadblock, setting at an impasse with a figure of $10,000. So how much you want for this thing? I've seen cars of this caliber sell for upwards of $100,000. Whoa. What do you want for it, though? How close to that number do you think you can get? Like 10 grand? <laughs> I get $10,000 worth of time circuits in the dash. Even if it was a stock DeLorean, it'd be worth twice that much. You gotta come up a little. <laughs> um, 80? No. 
I will give you like 10 grand for it and <laughs> I'll try and do something with it. I know you got a gazillion man hours into it and everything like that, but to get it mechanically right, it would cost you more than the car's worth. The original time machine would probably go for several million dollars. So based on that, I would have to say that an almost exacting replica of it has got to be a, a decent fraction of that. <laughs> it's sort of like this. You take a Picasso, then Chum Lee right here draws something that's almost identical. I can do it. <laughs> How much you want to pay? You know, that's just it. There's the original and then you have this. Um, Think of the draw of putting it in the store. People will funnel in to see it. All I can tell you is thanks for bringing it by. Well, thank you. All right, thanks for coming by, man. You never know what the future can hold, but with this car, I do. Da Vinci flying machine model. Pete arrived at the shop with a sky-high treasure, a Leonardo da Vinci flying machine that once graced an East Coast museum. All right, well, you definitely got my attention. <laughs> so uh, this thing is a Leonardo da Vinci flying machine? That's what I'm told it is. I was told it hung in a museum out on the East Coast. Okay. Leonardo da Vinci was obsessed with flying. He wrote, like, thousands of pages on it, trying to figure it out. And I am absolutely positive if ever anyone did strap this thing on, they would be very quickly dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely cool. I really like it. Yeah, I mean, it's Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, everyone knows him from his painting of The Last Supper and of course the Mona Lisa. Leonardo da Vinci was born early 1450s, but back then people didn't know much about him. Up until the 1800s, he was just considered an artist, but he was just a man of so many different talents. I mean, he was really, really beyond his time. He was talking about gravity 200 years before Sir Isaac Newton, but all of his writings were held in private hands. So the general public never got to see this stuff. If he only published everything he wrote back then, it would probably be a lot more advanced right now. So this looks like a model from the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci for human-powered flight. Most of his flying machines, he wanted to duplicate the actions of birds. So through these series of pulleys and everything right here, you would have been able to flap the wings. And then they're on a pivot, they're on a hinge, which would make you able to change direction of flight. And there was a lot of thought that went into it, but it's completely impractical. You know, the human body is not strong enough to create its own lift. Let's take a look. There's some issues going on here because we have uh, like some broken parts here, which would looks like they'd be very difficult to duplicate. So how much you want for this thing? I was asking $2,400. I'm really impressed with the quality of it. I mean, th there's some issues. There's a lot of restoration work that has to be done to this thing. As far as being in a museum, it could have been. Let me have a museum guy look at it real quick. Expert Mark verified its authenticity as an ornithopter, a human-powered flying marvel. Oh, ho, ho. so this is the ornithopter. An ornithopter. Ornithopter, yes. So what is the translation of ornithopter? An ornithopter is a human-powered flying machine. You know, if you want to go out and get in, you know, strap on your wings and go flying somewhere, this is what you need. Well, this is not what you need because this one's not going to work for you. So this is the one that was designed by Leonardo da Vinci. It's a model of it, obviously. Now, da Vinci was interesting. He wasn't the first one to design one of these things. There was actually a monk who designed one about 100 years before this and jumped off a steeple and fell in the, the snow. It didn't work for him either. <laughs> <laughs> but Leonardo became very interested in flight mainly because of his interest in military armaments. And he thought that if you could fly, you could get aerial reconnaissance of the opposing forces. So he began to really research Birds. And this particular design was one that was in one of his, his writings. Okay, but it's pretty correct. Yeah, it looks to me from what I'm seeing on it, yeah. The details are quite nice on it, and it's well made. He was saying this was like a museum model or something like that. I, huh. I just don't know. It's possible there's no way to say for sure without some sort of paperwork with it. And normally, if this was part of a museum collection, it would have a museum number on it. I don't see any sign of an accession number. So my guess is if it was in a museum, it was just what we would call a prop. All right. Rick, both impressed and cautious, offered $800. Okay, so I'd give you 800 bucks for it because it's gonna cost me 1,000 bucks just for someone to make it pretty again. Would you do 1,000? Nope. I am buying myself an incredible headache. That's all I'm buying here, okay? I will give you 800 bucks for it, and then I gotta restore it, and hopefully he only charges me like $1,000 and doesn't come along and say it's gonna be 5,000, and then therefore it's just trash. So I am gambling at 800 bucks. 
Yeah, I'll take 800. All right, sweet. Um, I have an ornithopter. Uh, just cruise over to the pawn counter over there, uh, get your ID, we'll do some paperwork, and I'll get you paid. All right. Oreodon Skull Fossil. A seller presented a fascinating discovery. An Oreodon Fossil. What do you have here? I have a Oreodon Fossil. I prefer my Oreos dipped in milk. Huh. This is pretty cool, man. As far as I know, an Oreodont would have been kind of like a sheep, and they would have been found as early as five million years ago, all the way up to 40 million years ago. So it was a hoofed animal, um, herbivore. You can tell by the teeth here, still intact, that these teeth would not be meant to eat meat. These were meant to grind up vegetation, and it looks like a pretty big set of bones you have here. This jaw is pretty big right here. Um, I don't think this would have been a very small animal. No. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I have no idea if it's real. I do know these things are faked, and it would be very easy to slip a fake right by me. What are you looking to do with it? I'm looking at selling it. How much are you looking to get for it? I'm thinking a fair price will be about $8,500. Chumley hesitated due to authenticity concerns, prompting a consultation with paleontologist Andre. Hey, thanks for coming in. Hey, Chum, how you doing? I'm pretty good. Uh, I have something what I think could be really cool here. This gentleman says it's an oreodont skull. That's a really large oreodont skull. Oreodonts were a very diverse group of mammals from the Oligocene, kind of closely related to camels and pigs, if you can believe that. <laughs> uh, there's really not anything alive today that we can compare them to. They're pretty rare. Their fossils represent only about 1% of all the fossils found in the Badlands. Well, there's definitely a skull there, but it looks like there's a lot more. This is an associated skeleton, meaning that those bones are still connected as they were in life. This is where the animal laid down and died, got buried and fossilized 30 million years. So Chum, I'm gonna take this camera and we're gonna be looking for some obvious restoration, things that people use to hide blemishes. A fossil like this needs to be kept in its original condition. It significantly affects the value. That looks like it was done to stabilize the jaw. So I wouldn't really consider that restoration. Um, but if you look at this bone right here, you see those cracks? Yeah. Yeah. This bone looks really good. I'm not seeing anything that would indicate that this has been heavily restored. This fossil is in as original condition as you really can find one. Yeah, I can see it. It's pretty cool. I've got one more tool, Chum, and this is going to tell us a lot about the most commonly faked part of these fossils. These teeth should glow under black light. Oh yeah, look at that. So those are the real teeth. Those are the real teeth. And let's take a look at these canines in the front. Yeah, look at that. Oh, I didn't see those yeah. up there. Okay, well, what kind of value could you put on it? A specimen this unique and this complete with the articulation, I would expect a retail price of 14,500. Despite Chumley's $7,000 offer, the seller stood firm at 8,500 resulting in a missed deal. That's a lot more than I was expecting it to be. Would you take $7,000 for it? No, I came pretty set on that 85, and that was already super low. So you're gonna have to sweeten up the pot a little bit. <laughs> Especially now after you found out it's worth 14,500, yes, huh? Um, I think I'm gonna have to pass on it. And I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that want it, but for that price, it's gonna be a tough sell here in my shop. Okay. All right, thanks for bringing it All in. Right. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you. Armillary Sphere. Gerald walked into the pawn shop with an armillary sphere, seeking a $10,000 deal. Bringing in my armillary sphere. Armillary spear? Yes, sir. In the back of my brain, I have heard the term, but I've completely forgot what that means, so. <laughs> it, it's definitely interesting. Do you know anything about this? I've had a little research done on it. I've heard names of it um, as a astrological globe. I've been told it was made in the late 17, early 1800s. From what I can understand, half of it is Islamic and half Arabic, I think. And the ring, whatever this is, is Greek. In the late 1700s, astrology and astronomy were intermingled. Okay. It might be something like that, or it could be something to do with navigation. And things like this, if that's what it is, were used to travel all over the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and everything else, and they really, really worked. Even though I don't know exactly what this globe is used for, it's got me really intrigued. I've been doing this for years, and I can tell you this thing is really old. I just don't know if it's 100 years old or 300 years old. So what do you want for it? I got a friend of mine that uh, recommended uh, right around starting price about 10,000. Gerald, uncertain of its history, accepted Rick's suggestion to consult an expert, Phineas Castle. Wow, look at that. That's a Persian armillary sphere. This okay. is really cool stuff. 
this would be used by a Zoroastrian priest. The Zoroastrian religion was the original religion of Persia. And these priests were very highly involved with star systems. You know, 2,000 years ago, they were mapping the stars. Okay, so how old? What gives it away to me is this old Persian writing. You can just see how primitive it is on there. That has a tendency to me to say, uh, maybe 1780 to like 1820. It's a piece that probably belongs in a museum. So what do you think it's worth? One thing I just have to say is that, you know, I'm not crazy about the bass. It obviously is a replacement, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when you don't have the bass on there, it's not going to be as valuable as it would if you had the original bass. So I'm going to say probably in an auction somewhere between 1800 and 2000. Okay. Despite its uniqueness, Rick's offer landed at $1,000 due to limited demand. You know, I, I would give you a thousand bucks for it. I know I'm knocking an entire zero off, but you have to look at it from my perspective. Things like this are really, really cool. On the other hand, is there's very few people in the world who know what they are. Fortunately, I don't think I can actually take that little. Um, what is your best price? Fifteen. We'll cut it. I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> I'll go eleven hundred bucks. Twelve fifty. Got a deal. Eleven hundred bucks. 1100 bucks. Sold. Great, man. Back to the Future 2 Sports Almanac. In this episode, a customer walked in with the original Gray Sports Almanac from Back to the Future. I have here the original Gray Sports Almanac from Back to the Future 2, the screen used cover. It's been signed by Bob Gale, who wrote the film, Christopher Lloyd, who played Doc Brown. And this is really special. Tom Wilson signed it. He played Biff. Did Michael J. Fox sign it? No, Michael J. Fox hasn't had a chance to sign it yet, but uh, hey, maybe we can get him to do it in the future. <laughs> <laughs> this is really cool. How much you want for it? And I'm thinking like 7,500 bucks. Do you have any paperwork with it or anything? I don't have uh, any paperwork, but I'm sure this is clearly not something you make on a copier. To authenticate it, Rick called in the original prop master, Dangerous Bob. Hey, are you Bob? Yes, Dangerous Bob Wooden, set prop master on Back to the Futures. I like anybody whose first name is Dangerous. Well, thank you. That was given to me by Steven Spielberg. I'm Dangerous Bob Wooden, the prop master on Back to the Future series. And in Back to the Future 2, the whole movie revolved around the almanac and what it did for the future, the present, and the past. It's a very valuable and collectible piece. Okay. So um, you were in charge of making these, right? Yes, we made about 24 of them. We used just about every one of them because when you're in a scene, when you fold it and walk with it, if we cut, we'd have to go back and I'd have to hand either of the characters a new one. Okay, and so is it legit? Oh, may I touch it? I'm, sure. I'm gonna need to look for some telltale things. These marks here are aged just like mine were after sitting in a warehouse. And this tape mark here, is a definite plus. What was happening is the covers were flying open in the actor's hands. And being left-handed, you can see the way I put the tape marks on. Okay. So that looked really good. The colors are right on the money. Uh, I guarantee it's real. It's one of mine. Unfortunately, once a prop of this magnitude is screen used and is signed by anybody, that decreases the value. The real collectors, the majority of them, want an absolutely pristine prop that was used in the show. Okay, so what's it worth? As it is, knowing it's one of mine, unfortunately the signatures are on it, which is going to limit the audience, and I, I would put a fair value on it $2,500. Now, 17 years from now, it's going to be the 50th anniversary. Everything's gonna go through the roof. But right now, this changes the whole value of it. Okay. Rick hesitated, offering $1,500 and holding his ground. So how much do you want for it now? <sighs> you know, I gotta be honest, even though he's the guy that made the thing, I don't know if he's necessarily the expert on selling them. No, he is. He buys and sells the stuff. If Rob sent him down, he knows what he's talking about. Will you take 1,500 bucks for it? No, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I'd be willing to go five. This guy says it's worth 2,500 bucks. Let me just remind you, Rick, I came in here a couple of years ago with that DeLorean time machine and you said nobody would want it. I sold that thing the next week for like $100,000. I think you're gonna more make the same power mistake with this. Have a nice day. I mean, literally, I mean, we're not gonna come to an agreement. I'm gonna put it back in its frame and there's a little part of me that's uh, almost glad he didn't buy it. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Tyrannosaur teeth. Excitedly, Eamon showcased two Tyrannosaur teeth. 
discovered in Montana during a dig with his wife. I think I got a couple things here you might want to look at. Uh, we got a couple of teeth here that belong to Tyrannosaurus. Tyrannosaurus rex? Uh, not T. rex. These are an odd species called Daspletosaurus from the Judith River Formation of Montana. Okay. I know Tyrannosaurus teeth are really, really rare. Yes. Yeah, they are. I have no idea if they're real, but they're really, really cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> How do you know for a fact these are Tyrannosaurus teeth? So me and my wife dig for dinosaurs for a living up in Montana. So you dug these up yourself? Yes, sir, yep. How long have you had them for? Uh, we dug these actually this last summer. I know very little besides from what uh, I saw in Jurassic Park. <laughs> Both these are from a Tyrannosaurus, but not Tyrannosaurus rex. No, sir, uh-uh. How do you tell the difference? Um, T-Rex is only found in specific formations in Montana and South Dakota and Wyoming. So this is a little bit older, about 10 million years older than where T-Rex comes from. I'm completely fascinated with them. How much do you want for them? I'm hoping to get 6,000 for the pair. Okay. Intrigued yet doubtful, Rick summoned a paleontological expert for verification. What do we got? Well, we have Tyrannosaurus teeth. Wow, they're pretty nice. Those are uh, pretty unmistakable. Do you mind if I take a look at them? Yeah, please feel free, absolutely. All right. So what do we know about them? Oh, they're from the Judith River of Montana. Wow. You know, it really looks like you've got two different Tyrannosaur species that existed side by side. I think this is Gorgosaur. Wow. And this is definitely Daspletosaurus. I mean, this represents the two titans of the time. We're talking huge predators, 35, 40 feet long. Monstrous. So they're 100% real, they haven't been restored, they're not pieced together. What I would really be looking for is if the tip was replaced or if a large section of the middle of the tooth has been replaced. But this is as good as they get. Really an amazing find. Good job. Thank you, appreciate it. What are they worth? The market for Tyrannosaur teeth has absolutely exploded and you don't get to see teeth like this very often. So the big tooth is easily worth $10,000. Wow. The little one about three. Okay. Accepting the original offer of $6,000, Eamon and Rick sealed the deal. So you still want $6,000? Uh, you know, I know that you guys need to make your money too, and I understand that. So yeah, I'm very comfortable with $6,000. 6000 it is. Okay. Cut him up, Jim. All right, awesome. come over here. Thank you. Mysterious Rock. Teresa brought a mysterious 40-pound rock discovered in southern Utah to the shop. Got something here. It's a wee bit heavy. I thought maybe you might shed some light on what that is right there. It's been to museums, it's been to paleontologists. No one seems to know what it is. Some are even saying something ET. So who uh, knows, it's a mystery. You know, it could be a petrified spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> So where did you get it? Well, it came from southern Utah. I was just out hiking on my property, kind of in a sandy dirt soil, and there it was. No other rocks like it around it. It's a little different on the bottom, the rock spot bottom oh there. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, it's even weirder on this side. It weighs about 40 pounds. Okay, it's a really, really odd shape. I don't know what it is. I take my trade very seriously. So it's pretty rare when an item comes into my shop and I don't have some idea what it is. I've had it x-rayed. It's not magnetic. It's not radioactive or anything. I don't know. I mean, it, it could be something petrified. It's not dinosaur dung. Okay, so you had that checked out. Mm -hmm. Because it does look like that perfect piece of poo. <laughs> I actually took a little piece off right here and sent it to a meteorite man and... Meteorite man? Yes. And what did he say it was? He said, I have no idea what you have there. Meteorites sell at auction anywhere from 25 cents to $25 a gram. This thing is over 40 pounds. I mean, you do the math. If this thing is from space, we could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Perplex, Rick enlisted Mark's geological expertise. What the hell is it? Do you mind if I pick it up and take a look Please at it? Let's do. Mm -hmm. yeah. She got it in southern Utah, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, now that's interesting. Very nice. Well, I know exactly what this is. It's a concretion. There are two types, but whichever type it is, it's still a concretion. So I still don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is a natural formation when there is a void in rock. And over millions of years, water seeps through that and fills in that space with okay. a different rock. Probably if you cut through it, you would find something at the core of it, maybe a little fossil or something oh, that was in the space. Mm. And as it dissolved, this got created around it. 
and this is either a calcareous concretion or it's a septarian nodule. You're not looking quite as excited as, okay. as I might be on this. So it's a rock that looks like a turd. It's a rock that looks like a turd. <laughs> and there, there are but other it's... rocks out there that actually were turds. This one wasn't. Have you seen one with this shape? Yeah. This size and this weight? Actually, the largest ones of these that are known can be up to 25 feet in diameter. You don't want to have one of those come into the shop. But the bottom line is it's a rock. Are there a lot of rocks like this? Yes. So it's worthless. Unless you're a rock collector, I guess. Thanks, Mark. Not a problem. <laughs> I'm sorry it turned out that way, but at least you know what it is. It's a what nodule? <laughs> <laughs> I would put this in your front yard. It'll deter burglars because it looks like you have a really large dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing it in. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Dinosaur eggs. Rhonda entered the pawn shop, asserting she possessed a pair of dinosaur eggs from southern Utah. Hey, how you doing? Good. What do we have here? I've been told these are a couple dinosaur eggs. All right, so how do we know they're dinosaur eggs? That I don't know. Normally, I would think you were crazy and just brought me in a giant rock, but <laughs> mind if I take a look at it? Sure. I mean, it's definitely got some chisel marks here where you can tell it where it was actually like chipped out of something, which mm -hmm. tells me it's got to be something. I don't know what it is. I mean, I'm not a geologist. I'm not a paleontologist. Do you know if that crack is natural or was it cracked and then they put it back together or something? I wasn't. I, I don't know that. Any idea what you want for them? Uh, 20,000. 20,000? Okay. Um, you know, I'm not too sure on the value of dinosaur eggs, but I do know Nicolas Cage paid like a million dollars for a Tyrannosaurus Rex skull. Also. Wow. Well, that's serious. I got a buddy named Tom who is a paleontologist. Mind if I have him come down and check him out? That would be great, sure. To confirm authenticity, Corey enlisted the expertise of paleontologist Tom. So it's either a giant rock or it's dinosaur eggs. Oh boy. I'm just hoping it's real. Uh, in the early 1990s, thousands of these eggs came into this country and appeared in many of the markets. And at that time, it was a, there was a real excitement about dinosaur eggs. Let's determine that they're real. Okay. The first thing I'm going to look for is the uniformity and the thickness of the shell. If you look at the shell from the side, you'll see a very constant thickness. You'll see the color differentiation between the sediment on the interior right. and the actual shell itself. Well, in my opinion, these are absolutely original eggs. Wow, that's the, cool. These are are 70 to 80 million years old. But what I'm seeing is, What's I see that? a crack in this area that comes around mm -hmm. that indicates this egg was actually added to this piece of stone, trying to make it look like it's a pair of dinosaur okay. eggs. Normally, a single egg is never worth as much as it is if it's part of a pair or a triplet, okay. making them on the market more valuable. But knowing that they're not original to each other, it makes it less valuable. Any way to know what kind of dinosaur it would have been? This egg has been identified is dendrolithus. It would have been a duckbill dinosaur. So how much do these things go for? The value of these eggs is nowhere near what they were in the early years because there are actually tens of thousands of these eggs on the international market today. Uh, I see these made available anywhere from maybe $300 to $600 an egg in this condition. That's a big difference from the $20,000. Corey offered $500. Tom just said between four and 600 bucks a piece. Okay. That's what I would be able to sell it for. Okay. So I'd offer you 400 bucks. Can you do 800? I really can't. You know, I mean, figuring the most I'm going to be able to get out of these is 12. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I'll go 500 bucks. 500? Mm. Okay. All right. All right. 